Hello and welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, today's first guest is the new Boston Superintendent-in-Chief, Mr. William Gross, and he's going to talk to us about not only how he uh, came to be on the force, how he rose up through the ranks to become the superintendent-in-chief, but equally as important, what it means to the communities that he serves and how he is going to work cooperatively with other law enforcement agencies and social and civic organizations, basically to bring you the services that you need to safeguard yourselves and your property and your family. So without any further ado, sir. So sure. glad to have you on today, man. It's thank really you, good, Thank man. you for the invite. Oh, please, man. Yeah. Listen, I know you have a crazy schedule, so cutting out some time for us is really good. But I'll tell you oh, what, let's start it's, with... It's an honor. When did you get on the force? Well, I first arrived on the force in 1983 in an apprenticeship role. And that apprenticeship role was called the Boston Police Cadets. Kind of looked like mailmen, but oh, okay. we were police cadets. Okay, <laughs> okay. What, how did you fall into the cadets? I mean, was this something that your parents steered you towards, or, or did you always have a desire to be in law enforcement? Well, from a southern grandmother, I always had a desire. Mm -hmm. You know, I hated bullies. I uh, always loved law enforcement. But I got to tell you, it was pretty tough coming from a farming community in Maryland to Boston in 1975. Okay. There were a little civil unrest, forced busing. Yeah. And, um, Trust me, the police department's relationship with communities of color back then, right. it wasn't, is, wasn't um, that great. So wait, in 75, how old were you? I was 12. You were 12 when you right. came up. But I always wanted to go into law enforcement or the Air Force. Okay, so. okay. You never went into the service? No, I did not. Okay. Um, I graduated from Boston Technical High School, which mm -hmm. is now Leo Bryant, in 1982. Right. But there was a career day before uh, graduation. And we had folks from the Boston Police Department um, lobbying to, hey, come join the force. And I did so the following year in 1983 uh, as a Boston police cadet. And subsequently, I took the police exam and scored a 99 and went on. I was kind of fast-tracked right on and became an officer at the age of 21 in 1985. So when you got on the force, was uh, the percentage of officers of color pretty low? Yes, Okay. It is. Is it still that way, or has it it's increased? Still, it's still that way. We have some numbers to work on, but it's a more inviting force. Times have changed, obviously, mm -hmm. with my new role that I find myself in. It shows that, you know, cities can change, and the change comes along with more understanding of the populace that live together. So when you say you were fast-tracked, was it because you are a person of color from the communities that had a clue as to what was going on on the streets, or was it because of your desire to move up the ranks or a combination of the two? I was fast-tracked, number one, because of the score. Because the higher you scored, um, you had that opportunity to go right in as, as one of the um, first members of the um, academy class for that time frame. Mm -hmm. So uh, myself and several others scored a 99, and that Thusly, we were able to go to the academy class before the lower scores. Is that a difficult test to take and pass? Um, it was. It was. It was okay because in that apprenticeship role of Boston Police Cadets, um, I was prepared for it by other officers. I had many great oh, officers come okay. forward, um, both um, officers of color and mm -hmm. Caucasian, mm -hmm. and I soon found that your color is blue, mm -hmm. but. You also found out the rich, rich, rich significance of learning about other cultures mm -hmm. to get rid of negative stereotypes that, that folks had learned either from their parents or friends. You kind of got to learn really, you know, what a person was about, where they came from, mm -hmm. and that once you have that understanding, you will become a better police officer. I'll go back to that in a second, but it's interesting that you say that you went up through a cadet program because at the Sheriff's Department, we are presently talking about instituting a cadet program that will start in the summer as a way to give uh, some kids summer jobs, summer employment. And instead of just giving them filing jobs or something like that, what we thought is that we would create a cadet academy and right. bring them in in the academy under the heading of summer jobs. So although they would get paid a stipend, they would also work with the officers, really, and see what it's like to be in law enforcement. And as you know, at our department, it's really like a small city. So right. every possible job that you have on the outside, we have those jobs, communications, transportation, accounting, you name it, clearly uh, custody and control, but clearly everything that you have outside, you have inside. And so we're looking at a way of actually grooming young folks who may want to really embrace law enforcement and come up through those ranks. And we thought, what better way to do it 
institute a summer jobs program, but make it an academy. It's going to pay dividends. You think so? Absolutely. That, so that worked really well Absolutely. for you? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, talk to me about, actually, because a lot of folks, we see the police, and we see what the police do. We see how they do their jobs, but we don't walk in your shoes. Right. Talk to me about the actual job of policing and explain to folks what that's like. The actual job of policing, you have to know what the definition is, is to protect and serve. And no officer should ever forget that you're there to serve the community, mm -hmm. all right? In the past, um, that, was, that was kind of a tough thing to do with some officers because in the academy, you're trained to just respond to calls, take the report, and a detective will do a follow-up. But uh, starting in the mid-'90s, the new concept came along of community policing, right? And not only did the officers have to learn to trust the community and get feedback from the community mm -hmm. as to how they wanted to be policed, mm -hmm. the community at that time also had to learn to build trust. So we definitely learned to work together. And we learned right on time because in the mid-'90s, um, we were really uh, at the height of the crack war. It was affecting everyone. Oh, that's right. One of the highest homicide ra rates from 1990 right. to 94. Every year, between 40 to 60 teenagers were being killed. Mm -hmm. So, Boston stopped pointing fingers at that time. Mm -hmm. So, the police department started to work with the communities, uh, faith-based organizations, mm -hmm. the district attorney, the sheriffs, mm -hmm. the street workers, right, and um, the services of Boston. Everyone came together. And um, it kind of showed the bad guys that now you are facing a unified front. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. You can't claim this or that. Right. Um, strength in numbers. We, yeah, strength in numbers, a mm -hmm. unified front. And when you work together um, with especially faith-based organizations like Ten Point Coalition, mm -hmm. Black Ministerial Alliance, right. definitely showed a unified front and, again, paid dividends because that homicide rate, especially with teens, dropped significantly the next year. And that's when we had what we call um, the Boston's miracle year. So, but here's the thing, though. And my understanding is, and I wasn't around for that, I've heard about it, that it was a miracle in policing when you talk about the community coming together right. with the uh, police, the clergy, and other organizations. But one of the things that was not really embraced or looked at was, what do we do with these folks? We've got them off the streets. What right. do we do with them when they come back? In other words, corrections, what we do at the sheriff's department, Absolutely. hadn't been intimately factored in. The, the thrust was to right, lower the homicide rate, slow down the crime rate, get the uh, bad guys and ladies off the street. Right. But there hadn't been an eye towards, okay, you know, these folks are going to come back at some point. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that when folks began to come back, uh, the crime rate spiked a little bit, maybe a, a lot, bit. you know, because they weren't, the, the communities weren't and, and the police and weren't prepared. And that's a great point you bring up, mm -hmm. because you can't arrest the problems away. If you don't fix the family right. unit, right. if you don't fix the mentality and the lifestyles of individuals, um, when they become incarcerated, right. if you don't have a great reentry program like right. you do now, that's right. Right. then you're going to run into the same problems. Right. You know, you're going to go back to, it's like a boxer, you're going to go back to how you were trained. You were trained in the streets to survive as a drug dealer, as a robber, as a con artist. You come back out and you don't have any type of other life skills, you're going to revert back to your training and that training is going to be that life of crime that you learned. And you know what's um, important about what you just said, when you talk about the Sheriff's Department, our mandate, our mission is care, custody, and control. And when I talk to, uh, when I stand in front of, but, when I st but, but watch this, so when I stand in front of a lot of audiences, they're not exactly sure what care, custody, and control means. They know it means to basically to serve, to right. make sure that folks, their, the citizens and their property is out of harm's way. But what I do is I define care, custody, and control for folks that I stand in front of, and I start with custody. And what I say to them is this. I say, if you look up the word custody in a dictionary, there's two definitions. One is imprisonment, and that's what we're paid to do. But the other is guardianship, and that's what this administration is about, and that's what the prior administration, the Cabral administration, was about. Yes. Because, as you say, we've got to wrap our arms around individuals and try to get them the services that they need when you talk about the family unit. And so... We need to get them the services so that they Absolutely. can improve their station in life. And that comes through guardianship as well as imprisonment. But I, that, that guardianship is important. Then we follow with talking about control. And control is the element that allows you to reconfigure the way a person thinks, 
or X. It's absolutely important right? to do so. Exactly, and then we come with care. And I, I, I leave care for last because care is that element that provides maintenance, you know, health, wealth, compassion. And a lot of folks don't want to hear compassion when you talk about bad guys or bad ladies. But here again, if you look at my population, 85% of the folks that are with us on the county level are there because of some involvement with drugs. 42% present with some form of mental illness. So we have to have care, we have to have compassion. I'm glad you said mental illness. We'll address that now. Exactly. As well. You know, because the folks are with us for 12 months or less. So again, they're coming back to the streets. And so when you talk about reentry, that's right. key now. So now Definitely we work key. collaboratively with the police, with the DAs, you know, with the attorney generals and so on and so forth, uh, with the clergy around reentry. And how do we get folks housing, health care, uh, and employment? Everybody has to step up to the plate yep. and, and serve what they promise. You left out a C, commitment. It's a long-term commitment. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And also... Um, Collaboration. Yeah. So, yes. Um, you have right. a forward-thinking mayor, Mayor Walsh. Yes. You have Commissioner um, Evans, right. myself. And we work hand in hand with you, right. clergy. Right. Again, what was successful back then is is just as successful now, because we have this collaboration with the long-term commitment. We know what it takes to get the job done. Again. Right. We know you can't arrest all the problems away, but when someone can't be re rehabilitated, um, they can be rehabilitated behind bars, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what you aforementioned, that's what it's gonna take. And we do have a great relationship with you in working in, with the oh, yeah. program yeah. Yeah, absolutely. To, to prepare individuals yeah. to return to the community um, as productive members of society. That's right, and that's the key point. But where does that, but where does that leave our other partners? If they say they're going to get jobs for those uh, individuals, right. they have to come through and provide those jobs. Yeah, yeah. You know, for their lifestyle, well, look at what for we, their survival. But look at what we've done. What we're teaching inside now is we're placed a serious emphasis on vocational education. We have the adult ed track that leads to the GED. We have the special ed track for folks that need special education. But what we found is when you teach a guy or a lady how to lay a floor, hang a wall, uh, hang a window, Okay, uh, we teach carpentry, landscaping, custodial maintenance, painting and printing. We started an urban farming program last year. We're starting a culinary arts program this year. And so what we're doing is we're teaching folks vocations where despite the fact that they've been incarcerated for a while, they did learn something. And oftentimes, like with Northeastern's um, the five-year program where you have an internship or, or like you said, an apprenticeship, what we say to employees is, okay, you know, Joe Public may have been away for a while, but he did learn something. Take a chance. Make yourself useful to the community. Right, right. Along the teachings of Booker T. Washington. That's it right. is what it is. Right. Make yourself right. useful and productive. Right. And go from there. Right. You know, and back when I was a kid, and it sounded like when you were a kid, we had more schools that taught vocational education. Along the yes. line somewhere, they did away with that. But, you know, everybody doesn't necessarily want to go to college, but they mm -hmm. want to be able to provide for their families and for themselves. And in the absence of vocational education, you kind of figure out, so what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And you're right. So we need right. those entities to step up to the plate with jobs, with health care, with housing. You Absolutely. Know, because in the absence of that, folks get in trouble. They do. Yeah. You, know. you have to survive, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, exactly. you know, that's why I like working with you. We, as they say, we keep it real. We have empathy, you know. Right. We know what individuals go through. Right. And we never forget where we come from. And that's important. But you want to send a message that you want to help out. It has to be genuine. Right. And people have to know that you never forget where you came from. Right. And you're not judgmental, but, but you're there to help out. So talk to me about gun safety. Now, yes. a lot of folks say gun control. The reason I don't like to use gun control is because when you talk about gun control, somehow we always get around to the Second Amendment and right. you know, on the right for people, for citizens to bear arms. Okay, valid, good point. But gun safety... Okay, it's something that we really need to talk about because, as you see, you know, youth, young kids getting a hold of guns, weapons, so on and so forth. Talk to me about the the thrust of this new administration, Mayor Walsh, and, and the folks that he's brought on. How are you guys addressing the situation of gun safety? Through sheer education, all right? Parents need to police their own homes before we get there. It's their job to continue their bloodline to continue their legacy. Mm -hmm. So gun safety, what does that mean? Um, 
you have to ensure there's no weapons, weapons in your house that can harm your child, right. right? And even though you may not own a license to carry, it doesn't mean you can't go on the internet and look up gun safety. What if you come across something? What if you, um, your child's playing in the park? Gun safety is putting that mentality, do not touch the firearm. Mm -hmm. If your child is in a park and they see the gun, gun safety is instilled in them through you. Mm -hmm. Like, do not touch the firearm, call the police, mm -hmm. call me. Mm -hmm. You know, safety in many different levels, but it all comes down to education, right? And um, providing safety tips and changing that mindset that, hey, this gun is not a toy. Right. It's not a super soaker. It's not like TV when the actor gets up. This is for real. That's right. That's and bullets have no name. Right. So if you play with a gun and you could cause the life of your brother or sister, mm -hmm. as we tragically witnessed um, yeah, a few weeks back. A few weeks back with yeah. the death of the yeah. nine year old. Yeah. You know? Do you guys go into schools and into community centers to talk to youth about uh, gun safety? Absolutely. Absolutely, you know, like some folks think it's a touchy subject, but we can just lay down the basics. And stay away from firearms, don't touch it, yeah. don't, don't play with the firearms. And we're proud to work collaboratively, again, with the aforementioned partnerships, and we're gonna have a gun um, buyback program. In now, how does, that, really how does that work? Educate. Now, now, talk to me about that. How does that work, a gun buyback program? Well, um, we're gonna have a buyback program where if you find a firearm in your house, that you can turn that firearm in, right. and you will get um, a gift certificate, a voucher, like a, okay. a voucher, American Express gift card. We're working on many different things, even to the inclusion of maybe game consoles or clothing, There's something we're working on at present. But you also have the ability, what if you just want to turn a firearm in? Right. You can come to the station and turn that in. And we'll have several drop-off points, um, some churches, some centers, several police stations, and um, you don't have to worry about repercussions. So no questions asked. No questions asked, just turn in the firearm, right. because each and every firearm turned in is one less firearm that can harm another. Right. And also, you wanna know what that actually does? At least we'll have parents taking a look in their homes mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. weapons that can harm their children. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say this up front, this is not a cure-all. There's, there's definitely a multifaceted approach to ending gun violence and the amount of guns on the street. We've already removed 96 guns from the street mm -hmm. alone this year. Okay. So for the naysayers out there, it's like, hey, this is a gimmick, this is that. No. It's a multifaceted approach, faceted approach, and this is just one component. <laughs> At least we in partnership are doing something about the problem. Mm -hmm. We're going forward, mm -hmm. making an effort. But we still need to help parents. We still need to communicate with the children out there, the teenagers, and change the mindset. This is not a game, this is not fun. And above all, um, you have to really concentrate on how to solve your problems, mm -hmm. conflict resolution. So mm -hmm. again, a multifaceted approach to gun violence. What leads you to pick up a gun? Mm -hmm. Is it that you are in fear of your life because of gangs right. or violence? Right. or? Is that the only way you can resolve a conflict? Right, right. Because of what you've seen on TV. So do you talk to you kids witness? about conflict Absol resolution? Absolutely, mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. we, we definitely do. But um, that's one thing that we love about collaborations because sometimes a child's not just gonna listen to me. He can listen to right, right. someone that was in that reentry program that has lived that right. tale right. that can come out and speak to the young men and women right. about, right. Um, hey, this is real deal. You will go, you will go away yep. and think about your mother yeah. and your father. Right. What happens if something goes down? Right. Your mother right. may be visiting you in the hospital. Mm -hmm. She may be visiting you. At, at a, a funeral cemetery. home. That's right, exactly. All right? Exactly. Or what if you survive? Yeah. You may be, you have to use a wheelchair, crutches. Yeah. Either way, this is no joke. Yeah. You know? It, it, sometimes you see the young men and women out there talking and they sensationalize things and like, this is cool. No, not cool. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we do plan on um, speaking to the young men that are currently handicapped because of uh, 
gunshots mm -hmm. and wounds they receive and have them spread the message yeah. that this is no joke. Yeah. Once again, multifaceted approach, sending a message not only from the police, but the sheriff, from the mayor, yeah. from the community, mm -hmm. from the clergy. Right. That's what I call the village concept, which everyone knows about, right. but it has to be reinforced that everybody has to step up to the plate and do right. their job right. and do so for the long term. This isn't a two week thing where, hey, I helped out, look at me. No, we're talking long term. There's some attitudes that have been around for years that we have to change and change for the positive. So let me shift gears a little, a little bit on you and talk about diversity in the yes. upper levels of the department. Now, when Mayor Walsh came on, he made a point of bringing on a new commissioner, but his superintendent in chief is an African American who has grown up in the communities that he's yes. now serving and then empowered you to then further diversify your, that command staff by bringing on more folk of color, women, uh, Latinos, Asians, and so on and so forth. How important is that, and how, what kind of message does that, does that send to urban centers like Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, East Boston, and so on and so forth? It sends a, it sends a, a positive message. You know, before, we just spoke about, you know, how when I first arrived in Boston, um, forced busing. Mm -hmm. That's in the 70s. In the 60s, you had civil unrest. Right. In the 80s, controversial police um, interactions with the community. Mm -hmm. Call them like I see them, like Charles Stewart. You had Rodney King mm -hmm. out west. 90s, same thing, crack epidemic and interactions that were poor mm -hmm. until we came along with the community policing concept again. But there was still this, this underlying feeling like, is the Boston Police Department welcoming to all races right. to reflect the demographics right. of the city? Um, we've come a long way, you know, till now where, yeah, Boston is 53% um, of color, mm -hmm. right? No, mm -hmm. no longer minority, majority. And with that being said, um, I'm happy that the mayor and police commissioner have the confidence to appoint me as the first African-American police chief um, for the city of Boston, because I do remember those times, mm -hmm. and more importantly, I remember my history, so I know what it's like for the seniors of Boston who actually lived through those trying times, right. um, what it's like for them, because I, I talked to them, they're like, wow, we never thought we would see the diversity that we have seen in, the, in recent weeks, where you have an African-American police chief and the most diversified command staff in the history of the Boston police. That command staff being comprised of um, black, Latino, mm -hmm. um, Asian. Mm -hmm. For the first time ever, you have an Asian captain in charge of area A1 downtown, mm -hmm. a Latino captain in charge of uh, Jamaica Plain, first ever. Right. Um, you have a again, female who's... Um running the police academy. Oh, yeah, I was getting to her. My bad. Super <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent Lisa Holmes right, is in charge right, of, the, right, of the Boston right, Police Academy. Right. But our, our command staff is definitely made up of the city of Boston, right? It definitely reflects the diversity, mm -hmm. and, but there is yet work still to be done. Yeah. Um, the command staff is very diversified. Now we're working on um, diversifying uh, the supervisory roles and you know the rank and files. So with that, we want to send a message that Boston Police is for everyone in the city. Right. So we would like everyone to sign up for the police exam. Or what if you don't want to be a police officer? How about working for us in the capacity um, as a civilian? Right. But we definitely want to get that message out that it's a changing city. The department has definitely changed, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, there's work still to be done but we need to do that together as a city. So I've got to wrap this segment up. If folks want more information about how to get involved with the police force, how do they get in contact, or how do they get more information? Well, you go to bpdnews.com, uh, cool. and all the contact information is provided. Or, um, you know, call your, call your local police stations. Here's the operator number, 617-343-4200, and you can access any police station from there or even leave a message for me. Beautiful. 
So it was really great to have you on. Really appreciate and it. Thank you. We and this is a quick half you. hour, so we're going to have you back, you know, to talk Absolutely. more about this. You know, after you get into the job and you've got a year or so under your belt, we'd love to have you come back and talk to about talk to us about not only lessons learned, but what the future is going to look like for the city of Boston now that we do have these extraordinary changes underfoot. Absolutely, and thank you for the partnership and making sure our communities are safe as they can be. Hey Amen. When you're working with great people, it's a, it's a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. All right, folks, look, we're about to go to a break. On the other side, we've got Steve Crosby, the chairman of the Gaming Commission, coming on. Wow. And he's going to talk to us about um, the uh, slot uh, parlor that's uh, just been given a license and some of the casinos that are going to be coming online soon. So please do stay tuned.